Hello, I'm Karen Davis, the founder and president of United Poultry Concerns, and I'm going to speak to you now about chickens. And specifically, the title of my presentation is Humane Eggs and Happy Wings, The Life and Death of Chickens Farmed for Food. Now, this is a an unhappy story about unhappy wings and inhumane eggs as far as the breeding and raising and slaughtering of these birds by the poultry industry. I will also, in the course of my presentation, tell you some things about the chickens who have been rescued and live in our sanctuary here in Machiponco, Virginia, which is on the eastern shore of Virginia, which is one of the largest chicken producing areas of the United States, where at any given time, over a half a billion chickens are locked up in dark, filthy houses, each one comprising 30 to 40,000 baby chickens under the age of six weeks. This area, known as the Delmarva Peninsula, prides itself on being what it calls the birthplace of the broiler industry. And what that means is that this is where the chicken meat industry became established in the mid 20th century following World War II. Now at any given time throughout the world, there are about 40 or 50 billion chickens at any given time being raised and slaughtered as a global food source. At any given time, there are 7 billion plus hens living in battery cages or so-called cage-free operations, but throughout the world, it's mainly battery cages for the egg industry. Now, it's very difficult for us to fully understand the suffering that chickens experience in being incarcerated and manipulated for eggs and for slaughter as a so-called meat type bird. It is very important to understand that chickens evolved many thousands of years ago in the tropical forests of Southeast Asia on the foothills of the Himalayan mountains and that to this day, wild chickens, natural living chickens, live with their families, hens, roosters, and chicks, in extended flocks in Asia, in India, and in the Himalayan mountains. These birds live benignly on the planet. They are happy. They are vigorous. They sleep in trees together. Chickens are family birds. Roosters participate from the beginning of their chick's birth to in the family life. And in fact, roosters help the hens find the proper nesting place uh, to lay their eggs. Um, and they guard the hens while the hens are sitting on their eggs for 21 days in the secluded, hopefully predator-proof nest that they scrape together, uh, free from being discovered by predators. So the roosters are very engaged in the life of the hens and their chicks. And one of the things that has been pointed out by those who through the centuries have raised families of chickens is how uh, the chicks will often ride on the backs of both the hens and the roosters. Uh, the baby chicks. The roosters enjoy the company of their chicks and they safeguard their hens even as the hens themselves safeguard their young. So chickens have an active family life. They're very cheerful birds. They're full of zest and energy and that's how they're intended to live. Chickens love to bathe in the sun. They love to take what are called dust baths which are comparable to a human uh, water bath, which is how they keep themselves clean. 
They love to get down in the dirt and they love to get those particles of earth through their feathers. And it's a very sensuous experience for them, which they like to do particularly in groups. They love to run around. At our sanctuary, I see all of the chickens, regardless of what kind of a background they came from, in virtually every case, an abusive background, but sometimes they had a nice life but had to be uh, given to us for one reason or another. But the thing is, there are all different kinds of chickens living here in our sanctuary at United Poultry Concerns in Virginia, and they all like to do basically the same things. If they've been bred for meat and are called broiler chickens, which we don't call them, of course, if they have been bred and rescued from the egg industry, from battery cages, if they came from backyard chicken flocks, um, or if they came from cockfighting raids, which all of which types of chickens we have right now living together in our sanctuary. The thing is, they all want to do chicken things. And one of the things I point out to people about hens and roosters who have been rescued from the chicken meat industry and from the commercial egg industry is that regardless of what they have gone through, regardless of the fact that they never set foot on the earth itself before in their lives, regardless of the fact that they never knew any kind of a normal chicken experience, once they are set on the ground, on the earth, once they perceive themselves as surrounded by trees and bushes and grass, once they divest themselves of the traumas they've endured, the bewildering misery they've endured, they begin to emerge as chickens, that is, as the jungle fowl from which they evolved many tens of thousands of years ago in Asia and India. And again, to reiterate, they like to sunbathe, they love to dust bathe, they love to socialize, they love to perch in trees in groups, um, they love to run around, they like to walk around. And of course, in nature, the majority of time chickens spend year by year is raising and looking after their families, that is incubating eggs, helping their chicks hatch properly, teaching their chicks what's what, that is, what, you know, food to eat and uh, where to go and so on, and uh, to be on the lookout for predators. And of course, food finding is a very important uh, part of their lives. And chickens are what are known as foragers. That is, they forage in the ground with their beaks and their claws. Uh, poultry researchers have said that each chicken uh, scratches in the ground and pecks about 15,000 times per day. So that shows how important pecking in the ground is for them, which makes sense for chickens since that's how they, in the natural world, obtain their food find all kinds of micronutrients and explore their world. Their beaks are very sensitive and um, it is one of the most cruel things that when they are kept in cages, when they are forced to live in sheds away from the earth, they cannot express their natural need and desire to forage Vig vigorously in the ground with their claws and their beaks. So an important thing to understand about the poultry and egg industry from the chicken's point of view is that everything they evolved to do, everything that their anatomy and their neurophysiologically are patterned and genetically designed to do, is thwarted and frustrated and denied them in these systems in which they are forced to live. So for example, you take a hen who has uh, 
is designed, again, I say that uh, most of her life would be spent incubating eggs, raising her chicks, looking after her chicks. And of course, as I mentioned, the roosters are very involved in their own family life. But here's this hen now. She's born in a, an incubator drawer in a huge hatchery, in a huge incubator full of drawers, full of thousands and thousands of embryonated eggs. And she struggles out of the egg in the drawer with these thousands of other chicks. And there is no mother hen to help her hatch as there would be in nature. There is no mother hen to welcome her into the world. There is no mother hen to shelter her under the mother hen's wings. And again, chickens have an innate need to be sheltered under their mother's wings. And their mother, who is in a separate breeding facility, along with some roosters, never have a chance to actually experience being a mother to her own chicks. So the, the chick comes into the world um, in a mechanical world. Uh, she and the thousands of others who hatch with her uh, go onto these metal carousels, which include chutes, which S-H-O-O-T-S, uh, -O -O which hurl them down into uh, holes where, for example, in the egg industry, the male chicks are gonna go into these holes and they're gonna, from there go into a machine that is going to grind them up alive. That's the main way of destroying the male chicks in the egg industry since they have no commercial use for the egg industry, since they don't lay eggs. The only male chicks who are kept in the egg industry are the few who are bred specifically for the breeding flocks, because you have to have males in order to produce the baby chicks who are gonna become the hens. But uh, the, the many millions of uh, chicks, rooster chicks born in the egg industry are going to be ground up alive or they're going to be suffocated to death in plastic. And in some cases, they will be electrocuted, which is a very uh, horrific death. They're all horrific methods of death. Uh, so the hens, meanwhile, are going to go to what they call in the hatchery, the servicing rooms. And the servicing consists of debeaking them. Uh, that is removing a significant portion of the upper beak of the hen because in order to live in a crowded situation, which is completely unnatural for chickens, hens, and roosters, to be able to live in those conditions with nothing to peck except mash, which is in troughs in front of the cages or in, in, you know, there in whatever type of uh, facility they're living in while they're laying their zillions of eggs, um, they have nothing meaningful or normal to do with their beaks, but chickens have not been known for decades to have an inborn genetic need to peck, peck. So if they don't have soil to peck at, if they don't have seeds to peck at, if they don't have leaves to yank at, if they don't have grains to peck at, um, they will be driven abnormally, in many cases, to peck at one another because there's nothing there for them but metal and plastic. And the mash they're fed is a completely unnatural diet because chickens like to peck at objects, at grains and seeds and whatnot. So the mash is just powder. So because their need to peck naturally and forage naturally is denied them entirely in these caged operations, they can be driven to peck at one another because there's nothing else to peck at, but they need to peck anyway. So they will also try to take what the industry calls a vacuum dust bath, meaning they have no soil, no earth in which to take their dust bath. So they will do what is called a vacuum dust bath on the wire floor of their cages. 
And to do that requires space. But since they don't have any space, they're digging their claws and they're pecking and they're driving the other hens in the cage or in the so-called cage-free operation, which is totally crowded. They're driving the other hens crazy and uh, the other hens might then peck back at them. But the point is, the hens are not being what they call aggressive, as the industry likes to blame them for being. The hens are, as other hens are as frustrated as the hen who's trying to take a dust bath is. The point I'm making is that in these battery cage facilities and in these so-called ca cage-free facilities, the hens are totally frustrated. Everything that makes them who they are, every genetic pattern of behavior within themselves, every activity that they would normally conduct has been frustrated and they are in a world that is completely alien to their nature, that they cannot make any sense out of it. They cannot adapt as they would, for example, even living in a home. Because for example, here in our sanctuary, we will sometimes have chickens living in the house. Now they know uh, if even if they can't make a nest of twigs and sticks and grass in our house, which they can't do, of course, they know how to uh, jump into a laundry basket, for example, with a blanket in it and use that as a nest. Or in the case of one of our hens named Charity years ago, she liked to lay her eggs in a pile of library books that were spread out uh, uh, and piled on a table of mine. So the point is they could adapt what they already knew to the changed circumstances in our house because they, there are objects in our house that are similar enough to what they have evolved to, un to understand and be able to make use of. But when they're in a battery cage facility, they're in a barren place where there is not one single thing that resembles the world in which they evolved and which is incorporated into their genetic nature. So when you go to the baby birds who are called roost or broiler chickens, and by broiler chicken, we mean, and this is totally obviously an industry term, it's nothing that anybody really cared about chickens would ever call them, but when they, um, but a broiler chicken is by definition a chicken six weeks old or younger. These are baby chickens. They are chicks, actually. When they go to slaughter at 42 days old, six weeks old, 35 days old, they are baby chicks. They are peeping just like baby chicks. The difference is that as far as how they look, they are many, many times the size of a normal baby chick. They are very large, like maybe the size of a dodgeball or a volleyball by the time they're going to slaughter, but they're baby chicks and they have gained weight at such a huge rate and they have gained so many pounds that within two weeks of living in the chicken houses or the chicken sheds, they are already huge. They already fill up the entire house with no room to move at all. And moreover, they're so lame and they are in such pain, and skeletal and hip joint pain, that they can't move anyway. It's a horrible thing to consider the fact that when people eat a chicken leg, they're eating the leg of a bird whose leg was in constant pain when that bird was alive and a leg that was crippled. And it's a known fact in the industry that the majority of these chickens who are bred, raised, and slaughtered for, the, for meat uh, are lame, they're crippled, they're in pain. And one of the interesting types of experiments that have been done 
to test whether these chickens are really in pain, which of course they are, uh, and to also test whether they are able to distinguish between a food bowl that has painkiller in it and a food bowl which does not have painkiller in it. And what has been discovered repeatedly is that these so-called broiler chickens, these baby chicks, almost immediately recognize which bowl eases their pain, which, which bowl they then continue to go back to instead of the bowl that does not ease their pain. And that proves two things about these birds. One is that they're in pain. The second thing it shows is that they are immediately intelligent enough to recognize which bowl eases their pain. Now, we hear a lot of rubbish about how you know chickens aren't very bright, turkeys aren't very bright, et cetera, none of which has anything to do with the cognitive complexity of chickens or turkeys. Chickens are very intelligent birds. They can distinguish all kinds of things that matter to them or of interest to them. They know how to, to survive successfully in the natural world, and they know how to adapt what they've learned in the natural world to circumstances, as I mentioned, that resemble, that have objects that resemble what they would encounter in the natural world, so that they display agency. That is, they can determine for themselves what they need and what they want to do, and what they don't need and what they don't want to do. They are able to determine what is helpful to them and what is harmful to them. Meanwhile, these chickens who are bred for the meat industry, and as uh, I believe I mentioned, we are on the eastern shore of Virginia, up the road from where our headquarters and sanctuary are located, from which I'm speaking to you today in my office, are thousands, 5,000 of these long, low metal chicken houses. And if, for example, there's one little area right along the main highway here where there are 20 of them. And they look like something that landed from outer space uh, because they're, they're the silver metal chicken houses. And they are made so that uh, they are, the, the lighting inside is very dim and it's artificial and no actual sunlight is permitted to enter these houses. Now, chickens love sunlight. They take sun baths. And I remember when I first did an internship at Farm Sanctuary and I would guide people around and explain different chicken behaviors to uh, visitors, as well as here later at our own sanctuary, people would see the chickens often lying, sort of flopped like mops, on the ground and they would say, is that chicken sick? Is she dead? Or is he dead? And I'd say, no, they're taking a sun bath. They lie on the ground, they spread one wing out and they raise their feathers from their skin so that the sunlight can enter their skin. And that's how they get vitamin D and transform it into vitamin D3 through their biological processes. And it's a very, very sensuous experience for them like dust bathing. So for chickens like these so-called broiler chickens, these chickens who are bred specifically for meat production, um, are raised in virtual darkness with only enough artificial light to find their food, which is right next to them. So they don't have to move since they basically can't move because they're in pain and lame and totally crowded. Um, the lack the lack of any outdoor sunlight. When you drive past these chicken houses, these long, low metal houses that are the farthest thing from the natural world as can possibly be. I mean, you're looking at something that looks, as I said, like it landed from outer space. And it in no way 
resembles anything natural. And then inside the chicken houses, there's nothing natural. The chicken's bodies are completely unnatural. They are alien and dysfunctional. And I always point out to people that we can hardly, we really cannot imagine what it feels like for a chicken or any animal to be living inside a body that was imposed upon them from another species, by another species, which has nothing to do with who they are as a chicken or as that particular animal. These chickens have all this rapid weight accumulating, all this breast muscle tissue, which is mainly the only thing they exist for, is to turn into breast muscle tissues, tissue. Yes, people eat their legs or their legs are sold to Russia or China or somewhere, or their foot pads are sold to China and made into stews and whatnot. But the point is, the birds themselves are not only living in an alien, physical environment but they and just dy just dy a dystopic that is a bad place a place that's full of diseases and disease organisms a place that's full of filth they're sitting on uh what originally would be wood chips uh but these wood chips are only changed every couple or three years or so because it's a very big job to clean out these chicken houses, which were only cleaned out, as I say, only every two or three years, because the, uh, the again, it's a huge undertaking, and because the industry doesn't want to spend any money on a single thing they don't have to spend money on. So flock after flock of 30 or so thousand chickens are going into these houses. They're sitting in all this uh, filthy litter, these uh, wood chips, that, are full of feces, full of the chicken's droppings, which themselves are not natural because they're fed a diet which is not natural. And so their droppings are just accumulating um, and they're sitting in it. And since in their droppings, they have a product called uric acid, which is a nitrogen product. Instead of urine, like us, it's part of their, it's a component of their droppings, but it's the same basic kind of thing. And so these, this uric acid, as it is decomposed by bacteria, becomes an atmospheric poison. And the chickens are breathing this. And it's getting into their eyes, and it gets into their skin and their flesh. Similarly, in the egg compounds, the ammonia fumes, which are just as strong and unbelievably burning and horrible, if you've ever been in one of these places, uh, they get into their eggshells. So many chickens go blind from the ammonia fumes. And I can tell you that if you open the house, a chicken house latch, and you, even before the door is fully opened, you feel this burning ammonia enter your lungs and your throat and your eyes. And imagine that these birds spend their entire lives in these fumes. And it isn't only the ammonia fumes that they're breathing, but all kinds of other toxic gases, including methane. So when we talk about, and there's nothing, of course, there's nothing for them to do in these broiler chicken houses or sheds. They're, 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 they're not supposed to have anything to do. They're supposed to sit there and put on late weight and one of the reasons traditionally that chickens and other farmed animals have been crowded together, because this is not a new practice, it's just a huge mega expansion of practices that have gone on for centuries in Asia, in Europe, and elsewhere, is because when you crowd animals together and they can't move, then they put on weight more quickly, or they will lay more eggs because they're not wasting quote unquote energy uh, running around. And so the industry, of course, the egg industry and the meat industry does not want the birds to move around and waste food, food being the most expensive part of raising a chicken to slaughter age. So 70 to 75% of the total cost of raising a chicken is feeding them. 
So the industry wants to do the these egg industry and the broiler chicken industry want to do everything they can to minimize the cost of bringing a chicken to market, and they do that very successfully. So the chickens are just sitting there mired in feces and these uh, wet, damp uh, wood chips, and uh, they their feet and their breasts become ulcerated uh, from the uh, burning ammonia fumes. And virtually every chicken who goes to slaughter has respiratory infection, has uh, uh, these ulcerated feet and uh, these breasts where often the feathers have all been essentially burned off by the ammonia and uh, the, they're almost featherless and they're red and raw. So of course, once the birds end up in the slaughterhouses, everything is done to cut away all of these uh, wounded and uh, blemished and injured and diseased body parts so that by the time the chickens end up in little cell phone packages or in some other, or as a rotisserie chicken in a uh, Boston market, for example, uh, you do not see the condition that that chicken was in, the chicken who provided that breast or those three breasts in cellophone and styrofoam, because among other things, what they do in the slaughterhouses is once the chickens are totally dead, then they rinse them in chlorine and in parasitic acid so that um, uh, the, 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 the section that's going to be sold to the, to the consumer is bleached. And a purpose also is to try to remove as many pathogens clicking to the, uh, clinging to the skin as possible. Because these birds, it cannot be under, uh, over uh, stated, are just, they go to slaughter and they live just surrounded by pathogens that is disease causing organisms. Uh, they are swarming in pathogens. And all of us by now, I think, have heard of Salmonella and Campylobacter and Listeria and a, a host of other diseases that are rife in the chicken and egg industry because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that when you raise creatures, be they human or other than human, in slum conditions, in concentration camp conditions, in filth and crowding and stress, one thing you're gonna do is you're gonna stress the immune system of the creatures in question beyond what the immune system evolved to be able to cope with and, and then you've got this huge load of all these disease organisms. Uh, the birds are swallowing them. Uh, their mucous membranes are not equipped to, and the other parts of their respiratory system simply are not equipped to handle the load of pathogens, that is, disease-causing organisms. So, of course, the industry the slaughter plants have to do everything they can to try to remove the, as many of these pathogens from the skin of the birds as possible, and also to remove blemishes and other signs of injury and disease, tumors, et cetera, that these birds go to the slaughterhouse uh, embodying. Now, about the slaughterhouse, it's very important for people to understand that uh, chickens, turkeys, and other birds are not stunned in the slaughter plants. They are not and never were intended to be stunned. So everybody who advocates for chickens or turkeys or ducks or any other birds raised and slaughtered for food needs to understand completely that the word stun is the misuse of a term that actually 
describes a process that is more torture than is it if it wasn't applied at all. And what I'm speaking about is, okay, they, in the slaughter plants, the birds, they arrive on the trucks in the plastic or metal crates and they are grabbed upside down and they are hung on, their ankles are hung, uh, clipped, clamped onto the assembly, dis disassembly line, and they are dragged through these long troughs of electrified water, splashing electrified water. The birds are not intended to be electrocuted. Electrocution means you're supposed to be killed by the electricity, like when a human being is in the electric chair. Uh, they're supposed to be, if everything is working right, electrocuted, that is killed by the electricity. But in the poultry industry, the application of electricity going through the eyes and the ears and the hearts and the lungs and the whole sensitive body of the birds is deliberately intended only to paralyze the fully conscious bird so that their muscles are paralyzed while they, as I mentioned, are fully conscious and aware. Only they cannot move. Now it's been pointed out by slaughter plant workers that in this paralytic state, you can look at the eyes of these chickens and you can see that they are in a state of terror. They have now been as fully prevented from exercising any control over their body as can possibly be. So they're dragged through this electrified water. All this water is splashing on them. And then they come out of that water conscious, but unable to move. The purpose of that is first of all, to immobilize them, to fit them to the machinery of what the processes that lie ahead, the automated net cutting, the uh, uh, bleeding out for 90 seconds before they're thrown, both dead and alive, into the scald water tanks. The other big reason is to uh, open their pores so that their feathers will come out more easily after they are dead. Now, after they come out of the scald water tanks, they are definitely by that point dead. But in the scald water tanks, it has been pointed out by those who observe the process, how the chickens, their eyes, when they're still alive, when they go into the slaughtered plant, which millions do every year, their eyes pop out, their eyeballs pop out of the sockets, they break their bones struggling in agony in the skull tanks. And they, by that time, are then going to be dead. This practice of elect electrifying, not electrocuting, but electrifying the birds before cutting their necks goes back to the old fashioned farming practice, which is now resurrected by these so-called locavores and uh, humane farmers and whatnot, which is all a load of you know, falsehood, let's put it that way. Uh, the old practice of taking a knife and putting it through the groove inside the mouth of the chicken or the turkey, as may be the case, putting it through that groove and sticking it through that groove up into their brain and twisting the knife around in order to paralyze them by doing that to their brain so that their feathers will come out more easily. And so that being paralyzed, they're easier to manipulate. So one thing I'm bringing out as I describe these horrible ordeals that humans have developed 
long before factory farming, but adopted and expanded by factory farming. These practices have been going on for centuries. These practices, scalding birds, uh, scrambling their brains with knives, uh, doing things like raising them in dark sheds. Again, the scale now is way beyond anything that happened before the 20th century. But the essential practices, for example, it wasn't a factory farmer who developed the de-beaking of hens used for egg production and turkeys and the debilling of ducks. It was ordinary poultry farmers in San Diego, California in the 1940s who started, started using soldering irons and in some cases nail clippers and other devices uh, on their chickens as they uh, began to start crowding them increasingly on their own small farms. I mean, the story of the development of what became industrialized chicken farming, and chicken farming is the model for all industrialized land animal farming. This was the, the chicken farming was the first. But to read the story of the development of the egg industry in Southern California, uh, the chicken industry in New England and also in California, the roots of Tyson Foods in California, uh, the roots of egg industry also in New Jersey. Uh, I mean, the story of the development of industrialized chicken and egg farming itself is, um, it was a hair raising story. Uh, and it certainly shows you that the idea that there was once uh, a, a humane uh, uh, way uh, of raising the, and slaughtering these birds and a humane attitude really is not supported by the history. There's no question that on traditional old-fashioned farms, particularly before the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, chickens and turkeys and geese and ducks, who almost every farm kept, and who were kept in cities and towns as well, in Europe, in England, in the United States. Um, if they were on a farm, uh, they often could run around. Uh, they could eat the grain in the fields. They could uh, nest at night in the barns and in the tree tops as they preferred to do. So there was some leeway there for these birds to have a life that uh, was not completely inhumane. But there were so many practices that uh, certainly we would not call humane if we were one of those birds. So there's no question about that. But certainly, as you get into the 19th, late 19th century, uh, there was all this specialized breeding that took place in England in particular in uh, the 1840s. And there was actually a kind of uh, affection for the birds on the part of many of these gentlemen farmers and the farmers who had the means to sort of just putter around with breeding and whatnot. And they bred many of the types of chickens who then developed names like um, the New Hampshire's or uh, Plymouth Barn Rock chickens, et cetera, that then became bases for the two distinct type, uh, types of industry chickens who were specifically bred in the early 20th century and had been distinguished completely by the mid, by the 1950s. That is the broad breasted, fast growing chicken who became what is known as the broiler chicken slaughtered up to the age, age, age of six weeks old. And the Mediterranean derived little compact hen known as the leghorn or leghorn hen. They were two distinct types of body types. Uh, inside themselves, they're chickens. They behave like, just like chickens. They behave like each other. But the hens who have been bred for the egg industry have a much better chance of living a pretty normal life than the, ch the chickens bred for the meat industry because, as I mentioned, the chickens 
bread for the meat industry are so heavy and so inclined to be crippled that they can't they can hardly hoist themselves up even onto a bale of straw or a low limb which they will try to do if they can and often can do particularly when they're still very young if they're in a sanctuary whereas the hens who have been bred for the egg industry they have a much better chance like living in our sanctuary here most all of them go into the trees at night they're yeah. able to do that because we have uh, 12,000 square feet uh, enclosed to keep predators out and to uh, enable them to have access to the trees and bushes at all times, which is what they prefer. So yeah. that, it, yes. You have five minutes, just want to let you know. <laughs> so that brings me to the fact that our birds, uh, give me the opportunity to actually observe what chickens want to do when they have the opportunity to make the choices in their lives that they are genetically designed to do. There are things they want to do. There are specific places where a hen wants to lay her egg and will actually delay laying her egg until she can be in that place. Uh, they scramble at night, which is very cute, in the bushes and the trees uh, before finally settling down and becoming completely quiet uh, as to which branches they want to sleep on and who's going to sleep next to whom. Uh, this goes on every night. There's a lot of vocalization and uh, fussing and sometimes uh, one will be pushed off a branch and then she'll run back up again and of course they're with their roosters as well. And uh, two years ago, we had an accidental family born, uh, and um, I got a chance there to see how an actual rooster and his five uh, young, four hens and one rooster, as it turned out, and the mother hen lived together, raised their chicks, and just, they're out there right now. The hens, the baby hens, who are now, of course, grown up, and uh, the father and his son, who have never fought a day in their life. They all get along. They live in the same basic tree-filled area. And the mother hen and the other hens. So what I see firsthand here in our sanctuary every day is as much as possible how chickens choose to live when they have the choice to live as they please, to dust bathe and sunbathe and go into branches and to uh, sometimes get into little squabbles with themselves, both hens and roosters, which they have a right to do. They're very alive, they're very active. Uh, they have little dramas going on all day. Uh, they're full of uh, energy and interest in everything. So I get a chance to see that. The only thing, of course, that they cannot do here, although in that one case, the accidental family, uh, they a hen laid her eggs which were fertilized because our hens live with roosters and we missed that particular hen in her tree swall, uh, hollow and the day that i discovered these baby chicks under her i was totally taken by surprise and i was horrified but i was also thrilled um it was so sweet and uh, they're out there to this day that was in may of 2018 so they're out there or 2019 excuse me and they're all living very successfully and very happily together so i just want people to understand the chickens are not passive uh they are very active they're very alive they're very aware you can touch a the tail feather of a chicken when she's looking in another direction and she immediately registers the fact that you touched a part of her body uh they are aware of their own bodies they're super aware of their surroundings. They are constantly on the lookout and they're watching and they're paying attention to things. And when they feel comfortable with you, uh, their caregiver, as in our case, they love to have you around them, not just for food, but they just like your company. Chickens are very good at bonding with, or at least living in a friendly, compatible way with other species, including human beings, as long as they feel safe and protected and like they're not going to be tortured and, and killed in front of each other so uh, it's wonderful to be able to live with chickens as I do and have done since 1985 
it's wonderful to be able to see and hear, because chickens are very vocal, um, their voices and watch their body language and see what they choose to do and to be able to communicate some of this, as I'm doing right now in this presentation, to other people to help them understand something about who chickens are and what they want to do when they have the opportunity to exercise what I call their earth rights, E-A-R-T-H-R-I-G-H-T-S. We have no right to deprive any creature of his or her earth rights. But in the case of these chickens, that's what we have done. And we have got to make choices in our lives, food choices, that at the very least wash our hands and our mouths of the pieces of suffering that are called chicken and the pieces of suffering that are called eggs, most especially if they came from any kind of hatchery. And we need to remember that when we hear about hens living free range or living on what seem like nice little farmsteads or backyards, for every hen a rooster was born, and virtually every rooster was ground up alive as soon as he came into the world because even backyard chicken keepers either do not want or they or are not allowed by law to keep roosters. So you've got all of these baby male chicks who are destroyed. And we need to remember too that organizations like ours, United Poultry Concerns, routinely receives emails and phone calls from people who don't want their backyard hens anymore. They don't want them because they're not laying enough eggs or any eggs. They call them old hens, even though they're only two years old and they have years of life ahead of them. Uh, so the hens too are um, not likely, if people are keeping hens for eggs, to be kept by those people after the egg laying has uh, tapered off or ceased altogether. Then the people are gonna take them to a feed store for a poultry swap like they have up the road from us twice a year. Uh, they're gonna set them loose, which they do with the roosters all the time in the woods or along the highway or whatever. So I'm just saying that it's very sad what our species has made be the experience of most chickens on the planet. We have no right to do this. We do it for reasons that are both utilitarian and ultimately inscrutably horrible. And we don't need to do it. So we have to stop doing it. And as activists, we have to do everything we can to educate people to understand why um, we need to appreciate chickens for who they are and not for how they can be exploited and made to suffer for our trivial desires. Thank you.